was an investigative reporter and host of my local morning edition program. That is until that fateful day when I suffered a massive stroke. The day God got my attention. I couldn't be the road dog I had been all my life. My independence was gone. He wanted me completely dependent on him. Not a problem. I love God. All of a sudden, I had time to study. I started in the back of the book, Revelation, because I'd heard there was a special blessing in it. My reading skills silently were restored in a couple of weeks. All of a sudden, I was on fire for God. I couldn't get enough. Then I started watching Christian programming. Sid Roth was one of my favorite shows, and that's where I came across the episode with Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. They were talking about Petrus Romanus, the final pope. Uh, he says, um, without apology that very soon the nations of the world are going to look to the aliens for their salvation. But, uh, but, but what they're saying to us now is it's going to affect Christian belief. There is a professor for the Pope's uh, uh, University in Rome, and uh, uh, he is a very highly respected intellectual. Uh, his last name is Tanzniti. And he has written a paper now in which he is saying that very soon, not, a, not right in the beginning, we won't have to um, deny our Christian faith in the beginning. But there is information coming from another world, and once it is confirmed, it is going to require a rereading of the gospel as we know it. And that's the kind of information that we are receiving from the highest levels of Vatican intelligentsia. Now, as a former reporter, I'm not one to jump on the bandwagon or go with the latest craze until I check out the information for myself. They talked about a Catholic prophecy about the Pope and how Francis is the last. Being born into a devout Catholic family, where I left as a teen, my ears perked up. I quickly texted my cousin, who's still a Catholic, and asked if she had heard about this Catholic prophecy of the Pope's. She indicated that she had not, but asked if I was familiar with the third secret of Fatima. I was not, so I quickly googled info to find out more. There was a ton of information, but one YouTube video caught my attention. It was from a priest on a show called What Catholics Know. The priest, William Jenkins, reveals what the actual third secret contains, and it seems to mirror Revelation exactly. Um, I've talked to some people who, who spoke to him about the third secret of Fatima uh, at a time when it had not yet been revealed. Mm -hmm. And one lady who was at one of his talks uh, told me she uh, asked him about the third secret of Fatima. He acknowledged knowing what it was. And when she asked him what it said, he told her, well, I can't reveal it to you. But all I can say is imagine the worst possible thing you can think of and then multiply it times ten. Hmm. And uh, to someone else, uh, actually a uh, gentleman in the media in uh, the Cleveland area who knew Father Malachi Martin, he said he asked him about this third secret, and he said he couldn't reveal what he had to say because it was shown to him under the secret, uh, the seal of secrecy. But he said in the process of showing him the third secret, the cardinal who had it pushed it across the desk to him and said, we have just condemned millions of people to death. It starts with the words of uh, Lucia. I write in obedience to you, my God, who commanded me to do so through His Excellency the Bishop of Laeria and through your Most Holy Mother and mine. And then she continues, after the two parts which I have already explained, at the left of Our Lady, 
and a little above, we saw an angel with a flaming sword in his left hand, flashing. It gave out flames that looked as though they would set the world on fire. But they died out in contact with the splendor that Our Lady radiated towards him from her right hand. And pointing to the earth with his own right hand, the angel cried out in a loud voice, Penance, penance, penance. And we saw in an immense light that is God, something similar to how people appear in a mirror when they pass in front of it, a bishop dressed in white. We had the impression that it was the Holy Father. She said later she didn't know what Holy Father it would be, because this was obviously a future prophetic 1940s, vision. 1940s, right, as she wrote it. Well, actually, the vision occurred in 1917. 1917 right. They really yeah. didn't know who it would be. She said we had the impression that it was the Holy Father. Other bishops, priests, men and women religious, going up a steep mountain, at the top of which there was a big cross of rough-hewn trunks as of a cork tree with the bark. Before reaching there, the Holy Father passed through a big city half in ruins, and half trembling with halting step, afflicted with pain and sorrow, he prayed for the souls of the corpses he met on his way. Having reached the top of the mountain, on his knees at the foot of the big cross, he was killed by a group of soldiers who fired bullets and arrows at him. And in the same way there died one after another the other bishops, priests, men and women religious, and various lay people of different ranks and positions. Beneath the two arms of the cross there were two angels, each with a crystal aspersorium in his hand, uh, aspersorium is a sprinkler, mm -hmm in which they gathered up the blood of the martyrs and with it sprinkled the souls that were making their way to God. Now this is all that were given. To understand this, we must go to our Bibles. Turn to Revelation 17. Now as a former Catholic, I recognize the colors the woman wore as the colors of the Vatican hierarchy, so I assumed she represented Rome. I spent two months praying daily about this. Turns out I was partly wrong. I spent a lot of time watching other researchers' video commentary about this, and most just regurgitated either what they had been taught or what they came to believe over the years. However, I stumbled upon a researcher named Chris White, who did a word by word, line by line study of the chapter. Chris, who I encourage people to check out on YouTube, calmly and methodically showed how the woman harlot could be none other than Jerusalem. I spent a split second of human ego wanting to hold on to my own understanding, but then the Holy Spirit poked me back into reality and acceptance of what the Bible actually says. How could I be so wrong? Then I continue to read Revelation 17, and in verse 8, it starts to talk about and explain the beast. And I discovered the Rome Catholic connection, beginning in verse 9. It talks about the seven mountains on which the woman sits, sitting on the beast, Rome being the city of seven hills. But in verse 10, it talks about seven kings, five fallen one is, and one is yet to come, who will serve a short time. Okay, follow me here. Since the Vatican became a nation unto itself, there have been seven popes, who are now ostensibly kings. Five fallen, one is, and another yet to come. That's Benedict, who served a short time and still lives. Then we keep reading until verse 11. It continues to speak of the beast, but then says, an eighth arises, and he is of the seven, and goes into perdition. Francis is the eighth. Catholicism is the beast headed by Francis. the Genesis 6 account in the Bible where angels left their first estate and mated with earth women is happening again with a twist. Since God sent the flood to wipe out all corrupted DNA, cave drawings, Renaissance artwork, and stone formations all point to a supposed extraterrestrial connection. 
a new deception to corrupt God's people. Thanks to the work of Christian researchers like Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, we know that the Vatican owns the world's most powerful telescope and observatory on Mount Graham, Arizona, and a second observatory at the Pope's summer residence at Castle Gandolfo in Rome. When hearing this, I'd had the same thought that Tom and Chris had as to why. I mean, this is one of the world's largest religions. What was the interest in space? According to Tom and Chris, they were looking for our space brothers, extraterrestrials. So Tom Horn's video with a quote from a Catholic priest immediately sent me down the reporter's rabbit hole. I sat down at my computer and set out to contact the priest that Tom Horn quoted. I started an email conversation with this priest and set out to get an interview with him. The subject was so earth-shattering that I needed to have a sit-down, face-to-face conversation with Professor Giuseppe Tanzella Nidi. I wanted him to say to my face what he was quoted as saying in the show. So I contacted Professor Tanzella Nidi and asked for some time to chat in Rome, where he teaches at the university. He responded right away and sent me the exact quote where I discovered he had been slightly misquoted. You can read exactly what he says in his works called Faith, Reason, and the Natural Sciences, Chapter 4, pages 89 through 112. Another bit of misinformation is that he's a Jesuit priest. He is not, but only works with the Jesuits, and his boss is a Jesuit. Professor Giuseppe explained what he meant in the article he wrote is that we would have to incorporate what we already know about God with the information these beings would be bringing. When asked how we'd know if they were actually fallen angels or not, he said he had no answer for that except that we would have to see if what they said lined up with the Word of God. That's exactly the point, as you'll see in the upcoming chapters. Brother Guy Cosmonaldo, himself a Jesuit and head of the Vatican Observatory in Arizona, says much the same thing. And the former head of the Vatican Observatory, Jose Gabriel Funes, had this to say in a report to the Associated Press. In a universe uh, so big, huge, I would say, uh, as the one where we live with a hundred billion of galaxies, with uh, each galaxy with a hundred billion of stars, uh, probably with uh, many of these stars uh, having planets, it could be possible that our life could evolve as the way we know on Earth. So we know that the Catholics are on board, but then I came across a startling teaching from one of the leaders of the Muslims. Seems Louis Farrakhan had a vision that he was taken up in a UFO, which he refers to as both a UFO and a wheel and references Ezekiel's account of a wheel within a wheel. In a tiny town in Mexico called Tepetzalan, there is a mountain on top of which is the ruins of a temple dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, the Christ figure of Central and South America. A mountain which I have climbed several times. However, on the night of September the 17th, 1985, I was carried up on that mountain in a vision with a few friends of mine. As we reached the top of the mountain, a wheel or what you call an unidentified flying object appeared at the side of the mountain and I was called from the wheel to come up into the wheel. Three metal legs appeared from the wheel, giving me the impression that it was going to land, but it never came over the mountain. Being somewhat afraid, I called to the members of my party to come with me, but a voice from the wheel spoke, saying, not them, just you. I was told to relax and a beam of light came from the wheel and I was carried up on this beam of light into the wheel. I sat next to the pilot, however I could not see him, I could only feel his presence. As the wheel lifted off from the side of the mountain, 
moving at a terrific speed, I knew I was being transported to the mother wheel or the mother plane, which is a human-built planet a half a mile by a half a mile, which the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us of for over 60 years. The pilot, knowing that I was fearful of seeing this great mechanical object in the sky, maneuvered his craft in such a way that I would not see the mother plane and then backed quickly into it and docked in a tunnel. I was escorted by the pilot to a door and admitted into a room. I shall not bother you with a description of the room, but suffice it to say that at the center of the ceiling was a speaker, and through this speaker, I heard the voice of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad speaking to me as clearly as you hear my voice this morning. He spoke in short, cryptic sentences, and as he spoke, a scroll full of cursive writing rolled down in front of my eyes, but it was a projection of what was being written in my mind. As I attempted to read the cursive writing, which was in English, the scroll disappeared and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad began to speak to me again. He you can see the video at YouTube in its entirety. Farrakhan says that he met Elijah Muhammad and spoke to him inside the craft. There are many other videos on YouTube from Muslims that say UFOs and extraterrestrials are not in opposition to their religion, which is the exact same thing that the Vatican is saying. Seems many other abductees also reference Ezekiel's wheel verse in the Bible. Even those professed atheists such as experiencer and U.S. tax attorney Ray Hernandez, who also recounts his experience with the wheel. It went straight into the heart, you know, like uh, the, the message. And then on the way home, I basically looked up in the sky and I said to God, which I now firmly know, uh, God creator, you know, not a biblical God, but uh, more of a spiritual creator. Sure. Um, uh, and to these entities, which I know exist, uh, I said, thank you. Um, in a four month period, you have managed to totally transform an atheist material rationalist into someone that has uh, more of a knowing, not a belief of a knowing that uh, a creator exists, that these entities, which are like modern angels, uh, do exist. And I thank them for it. After that, um, I had a download. Uh, I was in the middle of a traffic jam, and I was taken out of body, um, like in a matrix type of reality. I was floating, and around me was floating a wheel. The wheel had various spokes, and inside these spokes were various uh, what I call contact modalities. Okay, uh, like for example, uh, uh, near death experiences, out of body experiences, remote viewing, um, uh, channeling, you know, ETs, the spirit world, all of that, um, um, hallucinogenic journeys, that type of thing, all uh, mystical meditation, all mechanisms where humans can pierce the veil, uh, so to speak. And then uh, each of these different segments was in one of the spokes, and it was all floating around me. I was inside the wheel. What was holding everything together was consciousness. And then what came down in my head was an instant message. It wasn't like a voice. It was just an instant knowing uh, that I have to tell humanity of the relationship between these beings, the spirit world, and consciousness. When I was waiting to go meet Professor Tanzella Nidi in Rome, I began setting up other important interviews. Turns out my next interviewee lived an hour from me. I had secured an interview with the most prolific attorney of our time, Daniel Sheehan, who is not only former counsel to the Jesuits in Washington, D.C., but is also general counsel for the Disclosure Project, a group of prominent figures who want the government to reveal what they know about UFOs and extraterrestrials. Sheehan recounts how he was asked to approach the Vatican about what they knew. Good morning. Uh, my name is Daniel Sheehan. Uh, I'm an attorney and serving as general counsel uh, to the Disclosure Project. 
I'm a 1967 graduate of Harvard College in American Government Studies and Constitutional Law and a graduate of Harvard Law School. And uh, I served as general counsel and one of the co-counsel for the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case and was involved in uh, briefing and arguing the case in front of the United States Supreme Court, uh, giving permission to the New York Times to publish the classified documents, the 47 volumes of the Pentagon Papers. Subsequent to that time, I served as special counsel to the office of F. Lee Bailey as one of the trial counsels when we represented James McCord in the Watergate burglary uh, and uh, got Mr. Uh, McCord to write the letter to Judge Sirica to reveal the, uh, water, the Watergate burglar's relationship to the plumber's unit. Uh, in the in the White House at that time. Subsequent to my service in that case, I went back to Harvard to the Divinity School to study Judeo-Christian social ethics and public policy. Did my master's work and PhD work there and became general counsel for the United States Jesuit headquarters in Washington, D.C., assigned to the National Social Ministries Office and their public policy office. It was there in 1967 or 1977, that I was contacted by Ms. Marcia Smith, who was the director of the Science and Technology Division of the Congressional Research Service. She uh, asked to meet with me, and I met with her, and she informed me that President Carter, uh, upon taking office in January of 1977, held a meeting with then the director of Central Intelligence, who was George Bush Sr., and demanded that the Director of Central Intelligence turn over to the President the classified information about unidentified flying objects and the information that was in the possession of the United States intelligence community concerning the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence. This information was refused to the President of the United States by the Director of Central Intelligence, George Bush Sr. The Director insisted that the President uh, in order to have access to this information, needed to have clearance to contact the Congressional Research Service, to contact the United States House of Representatives Science and Technology Division, to have them undertake a process to declassify this information. Because the DCI suspected that the President was preparing to reveal this information to the American public. The Congressional Research Service Science and Technology Division under the directorship of Marsha Smith was contacted by the House Science and Technology Committee and instructed to undertake a major investigation of the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and the relationship of the UFO phenomenon to this. I was contacted by Ms. Smith and asked in my capacity as General Counsel to United States Jesuit Headquarters, uh, National Social Ministry Office, to see if we could obtain access to the Vatican Library to obtain the information that the Vatican had with regard to extraterrestrial intelligence and the phenomenon of the UFOs. Uh, I pursued that with the permission of Father William J. Davis, the director of the national office, and we were refused access uh, as the United States Jesuit order to the information in the possession of the Vatican Library. When I reported this to Ms. Smith, uh, she then later subsequently asked me to uh, participate in a project which I can go into some detail during the question and answer period or later to individuals uh, pursuant to which uh, I was uh, given access to as a special consultant to the United States Library of Congress Congressional Research Service to the classified portions of the Blue Book project of the Air Force. At that point it was in 1977, approximately uh, May of 1977, I went to the Madison building of the United States Library of Congress. There was no one in the building at that time. It was brand new. I was directed to a basement uh, office uh, where there were two uh, guards uh, at the door and a third uh, sitting at the table who took my identification, uh, verified that I'd been designated as a special consultant to the Congressional Research Service of the United States Library of Congress and was admitted to the room. I thereupon found photographs, some dozen photographs, of what is unquestionably a, an unidentified flying object on the ground that had crashed 
and plowed a furrow in a field of snow, and it was embedded in a bank, an embankment. Uh, there were United States Air Force personnel surrounding uh, this craft, taking photographs of the craft. And uh, one of the photographs, I could see that there were some symbols on the side of the craft. And so I, I proceeded through the photographs and found a close-up photograph of these symbols. Uh, I'd been instructed that I was to take no notes uh, and had to leave my briefcase and all my identification outside of this room, but I had brought with me a yellow pad. And so what I did is I opened up the yellow pad and refocused the overhead camera onto the same size as the, the cardboard backing of the yellow pad, and I physically traced the copies of the symbols on the side of this craft, closed the, the yellow pad back, put the, the microfiche back into the canister, reclosed the box that I had, and I said, it is time for me to leave. And I took this and proceeded to leave the office, at which point the security guard stopped me, and one of them said, what is that you have there, Mr. Sheehan? At which point I handed the yellow pad to him, and he flipped through all the yellow pages and never found the, the copy that I had. And so I took that with me and brought it to the United States Jesuit headquarters, had a meeting with the staff with Father William J. Davis, reported this to them, was authorized at that time by the United States Jesuit headquarters to make a report to the National Council of Churches and to request that the, United, uh, the, uh, the entire 54 major religious denominations of our country undertake a major study of extraterrestrial intelligence, which they declined to do. Uh, I was subsequently asked to deliver a three-hour closed-door seminar to the uh, top 50 scientists of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which I did do in 1977. I'm uh, more than happy to testify under oath to these details to the United States Congress and we'd be happy to meet with any members of the press at that time. You may recall I also served as chief counsel to the Karen Silkwood case in which we uh, obtained the rulings in the Karen Silkwood case. I also served as chief counsel in the Iran Contra case. It was the first one to testify before the United States Congress to the existence of the off-the-shelf enterprise of Richard Secord and Albert Hakim. I'll be more than happy to share the details of what I believe to be the relationship between this off-the-shelf enterprise and the secret government which is concealing this information from the American public. And I am happy and proud to serve as general counsel to the Disclosure Project. Thank you very much. Mr. Sheehan, who is in my opinion one of the most brilliant minds and a true intellect, was also the lead counsel for Dr. John E. Mack. Dr. Mack worked as the head of clinical psychology at Harvard Medical School and had been doing work with abductees. Mack, a Pulitzer Prize winner and author of the book Abduction, was being investigated for his work with people claiming to have experiences with extraterrestrials. Some of your peers look at you and they say, wait a second, this guy's off the wall. They, 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 they go as far to say you're almost a patsy for these people, that they seek you out because they know you have a sympathetic ear and they can tell you these stories. And if you've proven in the past that you'll believe some of these stories, well, why wouldn't you believe their stories? Well, actually, in the last five years since abduction, science has, many scientists of considerable repute have begun to see that the universe contains these possibilities that there are other dimensions that it is possible for beings entities to cross over seemingly from another dimension and to reach us it's not as far out as it seemed years ago what's the it was in this capacity that the two harvard grads crossed paths and she and began representing dr mack during that investigation some of the harvard medical staff were not in favor of the work dr mack was doing during this investigation Lawrence Rockefeller, himself with a personal interest in the subject, agrees to finance any type of presentation she and Mac want to make to the investigative committee at Harvard Medical School. They were prepared to call eyewitnesses from the head of the Federal Aviation Committee, pilots, police officers, teachers, to testify to their eyewitness accounts of extraterrestrial experiences. These are all highly credible sources and only a partial list of the hundreds of folks who reported some sort of extraterrestrial experience to Dr. Mack.
Another source who lives very close to me, but who I got no response from in time for this project, is Dr. Jacques Vallée, who wrote the book Messengers of Deception. Dr. Vallée wrote from a secular point of view and also interviewed hundreds of experiencers. On page 69, he notes that former director of the Photographic Interpretation Center of the CIA, Arthur Lundahl, deems some of the UFO films to be authentic. Several astronauts have also reported unexplained sightings of craft. In his book, The Way of the Explorer, an Apollo astronaut's journey through the material and mystical worlds, astronaut Edgar Mitchell, co-founder of Ray Hernandez's Experiencers Group, said yes, there have been ET visitations, there have been crashed craft, and there have been materials and bodies recovered. I note all these very credible sources, acknowledging the fact that there are also a few wackadoodles out there, to cement in your mind that these experiences and visitations are real. Ask yourself, what was happening in the day of Noah? All DNA was being corrupted. The Genesis 6 account in the Bible indicates that there was an incredible event leading to the flood of Noah's day. Angels left their first estate, saw earth women as beautiful, and mated with them. Giants were the offspring. These angels, upon doing this, corrupted mankind and became fallen angels. You can read about that in Isaiah 14, 12-14. The DNA of everything was corrupted, plants, animals, and man. It may shock you to know that creatures that we think of as mythical actually existed. Unicorns, satyrs, lion men, leviathans, huge sea dragons in the book of Job and Psalms, and giants all appear in your Bible. The book of Isaiah speaks a lot of these creatures but they're also found in different books of the Bible as well. My travels to Greece led me to many, many accounts of centaurs and many carved statues of these creatures. Greece was known for their worship of the 12 Greek small g gods. My friend George, who lives in Greece, also made the correlation between the 12 Greek gods and the 12 apostles. Most people think mythology means things that didn't exist, but in fact, the word mythology means mythos, one very old story having a significant truth or meaning, and logi, or logos in the Greek. It's a word-forming element meaning a speaking discourse, or as George puts it, how you speak. As Christians, our entire faith is based on believing events portrayed in the Bible. Christians believe Jesus was born of a virgin, was raised from the dead, and did many miracles in between. So why pick and choose what you believe in the biblical accounts? It says that there is nothing new under the sun, and that everything that has happened will happen again. So who are they of Daniel 2.43? The Bible can have two or three meanings for particular verses, but this verse is particularly peculiar. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Who are they? We know that the first incursion of fallen angels happened in Noah's day. And scripture tells us in 2 Peter 2, 4, that those angels that sinned were cast into hell and God delivered them into chains of darkness until judgment. We also know that demons still exist. Revelation 12, verse 9, scripture talks about Satan being cast out of heaven into the earth and his angels with them, an event after the flood. So there are still fallen angels and demons. 2 Corinthians 4 calls Satan the small g God of this world who blinds the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God. 
Accounts of UFOs and alien encounters go back as far as the flood. So Satan has come up with the new deception, one that scripture says will deceive the entire world. Any deception based on any man-made events will be subject to scrutiny by conspiracy groups, but this one will deceive the entire world. In 2 Thessalonians 2, it says when the Antichrist comes that everyone who rejects the truth will be sent a strong delusion and will be made to believe a lie. In 1 Timothy 4.1, it says that in the latter days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You'll see in the upcoming chapters that these aliens are lying, deceiving entities delivering the doctrine of devils. My conversation with Professor Giuseppe was quite surprising as he said he couldn't describe what was meant by Daniel 2.43 and that he'd need to pray about it, but was adamant that he would not be taking the mark, no matter what. I worry that he'll be predisposed to the deception because he believes that these beings are interplanetary and not demonic spiritual beings. Daniel Sheehan talked recently about the subject of human beings possibly evolving a new faculty in addition to our five senses, which I discovered is how these beings communicate with experiencers. So this poses the question, the epistemological question that I highlighted, as to whether or not there is a faculty that's evolving in our human family, referred to as intuition, referred to as others that have a capability of, uh, of remote viewing, uh, precognition, uh, telepathic communication, there's a whole series of, uh, of, of uh, what they call Siddhi in the, in the Hindu tradition, uh, of beings who have evolved this particular faculty. And there's all kinds of discussion going on about people like Jesus Christ and, and like Muhammad and like Moses and like others that are these prophetic beings, uh, Zoroaster, uh, uh, Confucius, Lao Tzu, others who actually appear to be mutations, that actually have had this faculty fully evolved, and that they've actually displayed the, the functioning of this faculty, uh, and people gather all around them in amazement and, and tell stories about them, and then form religions about them that ossify into dogma and doctrines and then persecutions of people who don't believe it. Uh, but but, but the, fact, the fact is, is that, that this poses this epistemological question. Mr. Sheehan and I are two sides of the same coin, but we do agree on one thing. We both believe that the aliens will be introduced by the Pope. Dr. Jacques Vallée says in his book, Messengers of Deception, on page 112, that included in the catalog of claims by abductees is that there are three parts. One is that it's an intellectual abduction, where human beings are told they're incapable of solving their own problems. Second, there seems to be a racist type philosophy, meaning that some of us are already ETs and have a higher intelligence. And third, they bring technically important knowledge. However, it's important to note that technical knowledge is not the focal point in any of these encounters, but rather a deceptive spiritual message, which is passed on and experiencers are told to get the word out. Turns out that there's a massive amount of evidence that points to these beings being demonic in nature. I found both Christian studies and secular research that reveals this to be true. I recall as a child thinking, if I could ask one question to an alien, what would it be? Without hesitation, I would have asked, do you believe in God and you see the same God as in the Bible? I also wondered why you never heard accounts of Christians ever being abducted. Turns out that's also not true. Christians are having these experiences. However, the spiritual information is being covered up. It's been documented by Christian researcher Joe Jordan of the CE Research Group and former MUFON chapter leader and experiencer Guy Malone, also a Christian. Joe Jordan, unsaved at the time, recounts how he came to know that a true relationship with Jesus is the only way to stop this. What follows 
is the case of Bill D. Bill D. was an experiencer that came to us. He was coming to my meetings, and he had a story to tell. And one of my investigators and I took the time to go to his home, set up a VHS recorder, and videoed him for two hours and get his testimony of what he'd been through down. Bill's experience took place in Christmas, Florida, 1976. His, ab his abduction started out typically late at night, in bed. Earlier in the evening, he saw some anomalous lights through his living room window over a forest north of his house. He assumed it was a police helicopter searching for drug runners or something. Whatever it was, it agitated his dogs for several hours thereafter. He eventually went to bed. He was lying in bed, kept wide awake by barking dogs. When paralysis set in, this is something we hear about the experiencers, first sensation they get as they start to feel this paralysis. He was unable to cry out. He could see nothing but a whitish gray, like a mist or fog, although he sensed something, someone or something was in his room. His wife didn't wake him. The next thing he knew, he was being levitated above his bed. Then he had the sensation he was being suspended by what felt like a pole inserted into his rectum. By this time, he was alive with terror, but he couldn't scream. Here is where the story becomes very interesting. The following is an excerpt taken directly from the transcript of Mr. D's interview. I thought I was having a satanic experience, that the devil had gotten a hold of me and had shoved a pole up my rectum and was holding me up in the air, so helpless I couldn't do anything. I said, Jesus, Jesus, help me, or Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When I did, there was a feeling or a sound or something that either my words that I had thought or the words that I had tried to say or whatever had hurt whatever was holding me up in the air on this pole. And I felt like it was withdrawn and I fell. I hit the bed because it was like I was thrown back in bed. I really can't tell, but when I did, my wife woke up and asked why I was jumping on the bed. That's an unusual case in a number of ways. This man claimed that he had been able to stop the experience while it was happening. Of all the research we had read from all the top researchers in the abduction phenomenon research, never had we read where anybody could stop an experience. It wasn't there. So what did we have here? This guy off his rocker wasn't remembering properly or what? We were definitely puzzled because most of the researchers said that the experience could not be stopped. But yet, I had an experiencer that said it could. It had happened to him. These researchers have noted somewhere either in your own life or in your family line, someone has opened the door to this by either New Age beliefs or playing around with forbidden things of God like psychics and astrology and the like, or asking for it. Yes, people think it would be cool to be abducted. Somewhere, Satan has gotten a stronghold in your life, or not knowing what the Word of God says and believing in other deities as equal to Jesus. Guy Malone quotes an interesting and very credible source that questions whether these beings are here to evangelize us. It says, Dr. Carl Sagan, one of our nation's leading authorities on the question of extraterrestrial life, was, he was looking into this. He ends with, uh, can we exclude the possibility of an extraterrestrial evangelism? That's Carl Sagan from the Andreas and Affair book. And it raises the question to me, are extraterrestrials intentionally evangelizing us to an alternate spirituality? It's been documented that the alien experience happens throughout a family line in many cases. The Bible also talks about generational curses in Exodus 20, 34, 
Numbers 14, and Deuteronomy 5. It's interesting that over and over God tells us to confess our sins and repent or turn away from sin. You notice that if you find reports of a friendly encounter, it's almost certainly by a New Age believer, someone that's predisposed to believing that these are benevolent beings and that these people have no true belief that Jesus is the only way to be saved or have no understanding of the Bible. Galatians 1.8 warns us to watch out for anyone, be it human or angel, who preach any other gospel. There's a reason for that. These fallen angels are preaching another gospel and deceiving many and will soon deceive the world. 2 Thessalonians warns about the Antichrist who will come in with all kinds of lying signs and wonders. One such example of a Christian woman easily deceived by these demons is Betty Andreasen. Betty was a believer in God, but only had a cursory understanding of the Bible. She recalled the scripture about entertaining angels unaware and asked these beings if they were angels, and they told her, yes, they were, but not the kind she thought. What happened was uh, the lights, we had the, the power was going, the kids were watching television, my mother and father were sitting in the living room with them, and I was there, and suddenly the power went off, and we started to see a reddish-orange uh, light coming in through the kitchen window toward the pantry, and we thought, uh-oh, there must be a fire or you know, a police are out there or something. My father had rushed passed us, me, and went into the kitchen, and actually he was the first to see what was going on. He was looking out the window to see if it was the the police or a fire truck uh, making the red light happen, and uh, he happened to see these little small beings coming down the hill, and he thought that they were kids dressed up in Halloween costumes uh, as Moon Man, that's what he said. And then uh, what happened was I was out in the kitchen at, at that time, and all of a sudden, five beings entered my house right through the door. They did not open it. They just came right through the door. And I stood there astonished because wondering, what is going on? What is this? However, in my mind, I thought of a scripture, uh, you know, to, to help me not fear so much. And I heard, entertain the strangers, for they may be angels unaware. And who am I to say what angels are supposed to look like? It didn't look like an angel to me, but it did help me to calm down. And uh, the, as I said, the Beings were standing there, and the the leader was talking to me through the mind. And I'm wondering, well, what do they want? And what I heard, more or less through the mind, was that they wanted some food. And that's what I was thinking what it was. And so I got uh, some uh, meat from the refrigerator, put it on the stove, and I started to cook it. And as I did, the smoke came up from the meat. And all of a sudden, the beings jumped back like startled. What, what's going on? And then he uh, again talked with me through the mind. And he says, no, 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 we don't want uh, that tried by fire. We want knowledge tried by fire. And so I thought, whoa, what could that be? And then I thought, well... Maybe the Bible, I've got the Bible in the other room, that's been around for a long time, so it's like it's been tried by fire to to be able to last hundreds of years. And so we went into the living room. And when we got into the living room, uh, I looked over at the couch and all my children, plus my mother, uh, were sitting there as if they were uh, just suspended in animation uh, was going on. They, they weren't moving at all. And that, this kind of worried me at that time. And uh, what happened was the beings came in and stood there with me, and I, I uh, took the Bible off the end table and passed it to the leader. 
And when he reached out his hand, I could see three fingers. So I was seeing what he looked like. I passed him that Bible, and he in turn put it in his hand, and he waved his hand over it. And on top of it came three other small books, and he passed them to the three other beings. I found an obscure verse in the Bible relating to these beings or fallen angels wanting knowledge. It's in 1 Peter 1.12, which things angels desire to look into. Later, she was given a standard line for someone with a cursory knowledge of the Bible, that she was special and specifically chosen. The deception will be equal to your level of study of the Word of God. See, demons know Jesus gave us the authority to cast out all evil and trample it. You can find that in Luke 10, 19. Demons watch us and know when you get that. They will not mess with anyone who can cast them out. They need a host, as seen in the story in Matthew 8. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And there was a good way off from them, and heard of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. See, even demons know the plan. There is an agenda here. Here's what Christian researcher Guy Malone has to say. We're going to take a look at a little sampling of all the volumes and volumes of messages that contactees and abductees have reported the aliens are saying to them. And what I'm going to show you right here is that aliens are teaching people worldwide ideas about God that are unbiblical. Aliens are teaching ideas about creation that are unbiblical. Aliens are teaching ideas about Jesus Christ that are unbiblical. And it might also surprise you to know that Aliens routinely call, or they routinely attack or misquote the Bible, and they probably talk about the end times, what Christians call the end times, more than any other topic. And they're teaching that aliens will be humanity's means of salvation in the end times and from the end times. The following are the lies or different gospel they use to deceive. Author and secular researcher Dr. Jacques Fellet says in his book, Messengers of Deception, on page 85, that his research also pointed to the fact that some abduction stories point to a seductive nature in making you feel special. He also noted that experiencers are told that the Lord is on the earth now and that he is the chief of all the extraterrestrials. They also speak telepathically, and God says our words have power over life and death. God spoke the world into being, and Jesus is called the Word. On page 111 of Valet's book is that these beings are reportedly called the unseen ambassadors of God. Dr. Carla Turner, who passed away a few years back, also did extensive research in her book, Masquerade of Angels. The scenario involved persuading his grandmother uh, to engage in a sexual activity with a non-human entity, and when she refused to do so, saying she had only ever made love with her husband and he was dead, the aliens produced the dead husband. In the women of Taken, two of the women, Pat and Lisa, both remember being shown cloned copies of their bodies. 
just as Ted reported having a cloned copy of his body. But the explanations that Pat and Lisa received from the aliens about these cloned bodies are highly contradictory. As I talk about in the book, Pat, whose alien experiences, now this is the woman who had the 1954 uh, family abduction in Indiana, followed by the military's arrival and sequestering and drugging and so on. Pat had had, throughout her alien encounters, a very religious atmosphere or overtone to these events, instrumented by the aliens. Uh, for instance, the first time uh, there on the farm that the family was abducted, when, when Pat's grandmother began to, what we would say now, freak out and start praying to Jesus for help as these little grays came into the room, a blue beam of light came through the ceiling, just like in Star Trek, and uh, Jesus popped out of it and said, in effect, uh, they're with me, it's okay. <laughs> and as I'm very fond of saying, and I don't know why I like this so much, except it always gets me, I asked Pat what Jesus looked like, and she said, oh, he was beautiful. He was so awe-inspiring. He was blonde-haired and blue-eyed, <laughs> just beautiful. And I said, hey, Pat, you know, uh, look back at the New Testament. I don't think that's what Jesus probably looked like, historically speaking. And it went right over Pat's head, and she said, with, you know, tears of joy in her eyes, well, this one did. <laughs> they knew how to push Pat's buttons. She was a very religious person. She was also told, essentially, that the angels, I mean, the aliens there with her were angels, and that their job was to prepare new bodies, as mentioned in the Bible, for the coming return of Jesus and the resurrection. When Jesus comes down with the Legion of Spacecraft to uh, carry out this uh, changeover, well, it's the aliens who are in charge of providing those new bodies. You want to see yours, Pat, they said. So this was wonderful. Pat is now assured that uh, when the resurrection comes, she's got the vehicle for it. Lisa, on the other hand, down in Alabama, was told that the cloned copy of her body could be used in a very threatening manner. In effect, that it could be used to replace her if she didn't cooperate with the alien program and that no one would know the difference. Not quite the same story as the resurrection. I would point out that such an implication of threat and replacement was also made to Ted Rice during an abduction when he was a young teenager and there were several other teenagers abducted with him at that time and cloned replacement threats were made also at that point. Dr. Turner had a PhD in England and MA in American Studies from the University in Nottingham, England. She published several books on the subject and was herself an experiencer. Remember Betty Andreessen? She said in one of her many radio interviews that while she was terrified in the beginning, she later began to accept the continued experiences because they gave her a very important job to tell the world. Betty's experiences with these lying beings caused her to completely embrace the alien gospel. She's now completely into the forbidden things of God, psychics, channelers, and reports massive occult phenomenon as well. Her daughter Becky, who recently passed away during the completion of this project, herself an experiencer, was according to a radio show she appeared on, claiming to be involved in manifesting things, psychic abilities, speaking to the dead, etc., all forbidden things of God. I did want to say, though, too, uh, Patricia and I, like she said, um, we do have many different entities and uh, different beings that uh, we work with that come through, but we also have family and friends and loved ones on the other side. And I wanted to also let you know, uh, a few days back on Supernatural Girls, uh, Helene came through and was speaking, right, Patricia? That's right, yes. And uh, that same morning, and I had to tell Patricia, there was so much going on in my house that day that I didn't get a chance to tell her, but I told her the next day. Um, Helene showed up on my laptop, her uh, exact face, her whole face, her hair, curved hair and everything, and Patricia got the exact picture of Helene that she took when we were all working together. It, she looks exactly like that, and she is still on my laptop. So it's not like she's left us. This would be a gospel differing from the one Jesus came to teach. It's clear that Betty left the door wide open to these continued experiences, in part because she began to believe what they were telling her not knowing the true word of God. Genesis 1.27, we are made in God's image, 
If we were made in God's image and they say they made us, do these look like us to you? And there are reports of all kinds of species ranging from insects, worms, and reptiles. Betty Andreasen reports that she witnessed one of these beings changing right before her eyes from a gray alien to a ball of white light. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Back to Rome and my meeting with Professor Giuseppe. When I asked the professor about how he would go about verifying the info that these beings would be bringing to us, he said that we would need to compare what we already knew about the gospel with what they are saying, incorporating the new information into our new belief. We did a Bible study on Daniel 2.43, and he said he honestly didn't know what to think, and he would need to pray about it. One thing I want to point out, is that no matter what you think about Catholics, Muslims, or anyone else on this earth, God says we have to love them. Jesus says there's nothing better than to die for your friends. We have to love until death. Well, researcher Joe Jordan discovered a not talked about fact regarding the alien abduction phenomena. Several people had invoked the name of Jesus during one of these incidents and the activity immediately stopped. The UFO community didn't want to disclose these cases because they claim it would have ruined their credibility. I spoke to Joe and asked if the activity came back after invoking the name of Jesus. And he said it did in some cases, which I started to think was because they didn't continue to cultivate a real relationship with him. And the Bible backs this up. If the person doesn't have a relationship with Christ, in Acts 19, 13 through 17, it talks about an evil spirit speaking to someone trying to cast him out. The evil spirit spoke to the exorcist who tried to cast him out, invoking the name of Jesus the Jesus that Paul spoke of. The evil spirit answered back saying, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? So they know if you have a real relationship with Jesus. Since these beings only speak telepathically, Jesus told us to use our words to take authority. Number one, to realize that God gave us the authority to trample all evil. That's in Luke 10, 19 and in Malachi 4, 3. Second, understand that life and death lies in the power of the tongue. That's in Proverbs 18, 21 and in Romans 10, 9 and 10 to confess God and Jesus out loud. I wanted to ask Betty Andreasen, who still has visitations even until today, to ask these beings to confess Jesus is Lord of all and our only Savior, and his Father is the great I Am, the creator of all, and see what happens. I still hope, even after this project is finished, to speak to her. Jesus wants no one left behind. The problem is, with all these abductees, is that a real relationship with Jesus is lacking. I corresponded with Dr. Carla Turner's husband, Elton, a very kind man who wanted to remain out of the spotlight, and he relayed what I saw as a rather disturbing belief, which may have allowed the door to remain open. He said in a text to me that Carla believed in the divine. She read the Bible cover to cover yearly. She accepted the divinity of Christ and here's the problem, as well as Buddha and Muhammad. This is why I believe that the visitations continue to happen to her. There is only one true God, and that Jesus is our only Savior, and we shall have no other God before the Almighty. Carla herself claims that invoking the name of Jesus didn't work for her. Maybe that was because her belief was in many small G-gods. 
Joe Jordan reports that Jesus is the only way to stop this activity. And the Bible says, if you don't cultivate your relationship with him, that you will be sent a strong delusion and you'll be made to believe a lie. And Jesus says, if you reject the truth of the Bible, that you will be deceived. Remember, demons can see and hear and are familiar with you and your beliefs. These are demons. In 1 Peter 9, 8, it says Satan walks to and fro looking for whom he can devour. You need to have a real relationship with Jesus. I know some of you will see this as hogwash, but scripture tells us in Philippians 2.12 to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Some don't believe there's a hell. Are you willing to stake your eternal life on it? If you don't know how to get started, just get real with God. Start talking to Jesus because nobody gets to God except through Jesus. That's in John 14.6. Confess that you believe Jesus is the Lord of all and that he died and rose again so that you can get your forgiveness. Ask the Holy Spirit to live in you and then start confessing your sins, all of them. If you can't remember all of them, and many of us older folks can't, the Holy Spirit will bring them to your memory over time. And stop doing the things you're confessing. Be grieved for what you've done. In other words, be contrite. Then start learning about your new life, loving God. Simple. And by the way, just saying that prayer that TV preachers tell you to say at the end of their show is not enough. You need to stop sin in your life. Let me leave you with this. The Bible has predicted these things. And Jesus himself says, remember, I told you these things first. Mm -hmm.